Our text is the section of James' epistle read to you moments before. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Even if you did not know the background to this epistle, you could guess the identity of the author. You would guess that the man who penned this epistle was not a religious scholar or scribe, not a philosopher or professor of theology, and you would guess correctly the man whom God chose to write this epistle to his people was a man of the people and among the people. A man who spoke to people not as they ought to be, but as they actually are. James, you will remember, was a pastor of the congregation in Jerusalem. This man knew from personal experience the pitfalls of the faith. He knew the trials that his people were plagued with. He was plagued with them also. He understood the temptations that they met along the way of life. For he had faced them also. James speaks to his people in plain language. Always very practical and always very personal. James plants the flag at the peak of the hill and summons his people to the arduous climb. He does not tell you that the climb will be easy or enjoyable or even appealing to your flesh. But the goal in God can be reached. Now we have noticed that from the first chapter to this, the fifth and the last. And the verses before us today bear this out. Is any among you afflicted? Is any merry? Is any sick? These are not sophisticated questions. The subject of a lot of intellectual debate. This is not the stuff that would inspire learned essays in a theological journal or summon grandiose church conventions to gather together. Is any sick, afflicted, merry? That's the burden of our text today. Things that speak to the personal life and experience of every child of God. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Well, let him sing songs. What an accurate description of the Christian life. Affliction and merriment. Joy and sorrow. Adversity and prosperity. Isn't that exactly the way it goes with us? First the laughter and then the tears. Our lives are an uneven, changeable mixture. All kinds of ups and downs. The storm and then the sunshine breaks over our heads. How in these two extremes that we all experience, how can a man remain steady, sane, and stable in all of the changing things of life? Turn to God. Is any afflicted? Let him pray. Please do not pray that you can escape affliction. And it isn't pious on your part to pretend that affliction is something you enjoy or that if you ignore it, then it really doesn't exist. 
pray in time of trouble. Call upon the God who has commanded you to cry to him in the day of trouble. Do not harbor cares within your heart, hoarding them like hand grenades ready to explode. Transform your cares into prayers and commit them to the Lord who cares for you. And is any among you merry? Let him sing some. It is also true that all our lives are not all adversity. It is wrong on our part if we carry on like martyrs, wallowing around in self-pity. The Lord has also given us light in our lives, not only darkness. Even Job, in his dark night of affliction, confessed that he had received also much good from God. And if any of you are married, have it made pleasantly and agreeably enjoying yourself, say thank you, that's all. A simple word of gratitude to your God, to the one from whom every good and perfect gift in your life comes. In every extreme of life, Turn to God, always and ever to God. Now, beware of this wallowing around in self-analysis that is so popular today. This constant analyzing of one's mental and emotional entrails. Troubled people searching for answers to their troubles in their troubled selves. How utterly foolish. And in seasons of success, beware of the intoxication, the illusion of security, that your success is due to your energy, ingenuity, or whatever. Praise God. Pray to God. And is any among you sick? The text continues. Let him call the elders of the church to come and pray for him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Here our text takes us into the sick room. Now there may be people who claim never to have been sick a day in their life. Ah, surely they are exceptions to the rule. It is in illness, in physical infirmity, that you and I join hands with the rest of the human race. You see, this is a pastor talking to his people. Sickness, suffering, physical and mental infirmity, that's a big item among us. Who live together and love together and labor together. I am pleased that the Lord acknowledges this. That he does not tell us to ignore this as a triviality. That he also explains to us how to cope with this. Is any among you sick? And what a wide range of infirmity sickness covers. From the common cold, fever, and flu. To maiming accidents. Blood and bone and organ diseases of every imaginable kind. Is any among you sick? It has happened. It can happen. And it shall happen that one of you will become sick. Now, I know there are people who maintain that Illness can be avoided. We've got these mind power crazies running around who actually think they can eliminate illness. The Christian Scientist Church, for example, a respectable body of people, is neither very Christian nor is it very scientific. But they maintain that there is no illness at all in this world. That it's all in your mind. 
Now, they may have a mouth full of fillings and bifocals on their face, but they maintain that all infirmity is merely a matter of your mind. In a farmer congregation, an elderly, heavy-set woman fell down her basement stairs. And her daughter says to her, you're not hurt, it's all in your mind. Here this woman was, black and blue, hurt and hurting. And the daughter refused to summon any doctor or medical assistance. She's not hurt. It's all in her mind. That's what she says. This is what the scripture says. If any of you is sick, and when it happens, and if it happens, call the elders of the church and have them pray for you. And anoint the sick with oil in the name of the Lord. If any of you is sick, there are two things now. The first is spiritual and the second is physical. One is prayer and the other is medicine. One is a friend that can intercede for you and the other is a physician that can treat you. If any of you is sick, call the elders of the church. Elder is just another New Testament word for pastor or bishop or presbyter. Somebody whom the congregation is called for the spiritual welfare of the congregation. Call the elders into the sick room. Within your sight, within your range of hearing. If any of you have ever been sick, you know how difficult, sometimes impossible it is to pray. When your body is racked with pain or your mind delirious with drugs or fever. How difficult it is to concentrate, to sort things out, to think. Call the elders and have them pray. Abraham prayed for Abimelech that the plague might mercifully be removed from his house. Moses pleaded for Miriam, his sister, who was stricken with leprosy. King Hezekiah, at death's door, wept with hot tears to God for recovery. And to Hezekiah was added another 15 years of life. Now that brings us to the second point, the practice of medicine. The text says that you are to anoint the sick with oil in the name of the Lord. The prophet that told King Hezekiah his life was rescued is also the prophet that advised the medical treatment for King Hezekiah. A lump of figs a plaster or a poultice upon the boil. Pray and then use medical means. And you who are familiar with the Bible know that oil in one form or another was the great medical of the Old and New Testament. The Good Samaritan found this guy robbed and beaten, lying half dead in the road dead. Remember what he did? He poured in oil and wine. The alcohol of the wine was an antiseptic and an anesthetic. And the oil for the soothing and for the cleansing of the wound. Isaiah once spoke of an illness so terminal that even oil would not help at all. The Greek geographer Strabo tells about an army that was laid low in the field. And the physicians prescribed external and internal medicine. 
wine and oil. And King Herod, in the torment of his dying hour, the historian Josephus tells us, his body was bathed in warm oil. So, that was the medical treatment. And that's what the people were to you. Now, I don't know how many lotions and potions today, how many salves and liniments, how many herbal ointments and antibiotics use oil still for a bead. And I don't know if the oil was to be rubbed in or poured on or smeared over or massaged into the wound. But what the text does make plain is that we are to use some means in addition to our prayers. Medicine, in other words. Oh, the question always comes up. What about faith healers? These uh, psychic surgeons in the Philippines you can take your appendix out without even opening the skin. Thor Roberts type. Healing by the television airway. If these people are genuinely empowered from on high to heal, then I would say to them, you go up and down the hallway in the hospital. That's where the sick people are. No, 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 no. Don't rent an auditorium. Don't stage a television theatrical performance. Go to the hospital. That's where the sick people are. Go there and heal those people. But they will not go. Because they cannot heal. And because they can make money. I mean lots and lots and lots of money. Profiteering on the sickness. And preying upon the desperate hopes of suffering people. Man does not live by bread alone, Jesus said. But brother, you do live by bread. By physical, material means in this world. St. Paul's young assistant, Timothy, seems to have been a young man. Uptight and nervous. And a teetotaler. St. Paul said to him, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and for thine often infirmity. There, Timothy was to pray and he was also to take some medicine. The loveliest example to me is that of St. Paul. He was in a God-forsaken place he did not want to be. A little riverfront city without a congregation. But there he met one man. A man who would become his traveling companion. And the man's name was Luke. Saint Luke, you know. Luke, the beloved physician. Paul called him. If you've got any idea of what Paul suffered in his lifetime, and this is the reason I like the story, how God marvelously provided for that man though he never asked for it, and in a way that he never expected. Five times the Jews lashed him, forty stripes save one. Three times St. Paul was beaten with rods till the executioner's arms grew weary. Once he was stoned and simply left for dead in the ditch. He was shipwrecked and spent a day and a night in the deep. He was in weariness and painfulness, in hunger and thirst, in cold and nakedness. He endured perils in the country and perils in the city. Perils among false brethren and perils among the heathen. Perils on the open road and perils on the water. 
And who does God see fit to place at this same time? Oh, but a doctor. Because whom would this man ever need more in this world than a doctor? They that are whole have no need of the physician, Jesus said. But they that are sick, Jesus said that. The sick have need of a physician. That is not a put down of our faith to trust, to use, and to apply medicine. When the two of them were shipwrecked, Paul prayed and St. Luke practiced on the Mediterranean island of Miletus. And many were the people who came to the two of them for healing. And Paul prayed and Luke practiced. And when they left that island later on, the people of Miletum honored them both. The apostle who prayed and the physician who practiced. And a little footnote to this story is, at the end of the line, in a Roman prison, where Paul is all alone and aged and about to die, in his last letter, he writes this little line. Only Luke is with me. Ah, oh, how lovely. <laughs> like life itself, people, there is a mystery involved with healing. The pharmacist, the physician, and the surgeon, they can diagnose, they can prescribe, they can operate, and they can treat. But they cannot heal. What if the skin won't close? What if the bones don't knit? What if after they've tried all of the proper medicines and procedures, the blood within your vessel still will not do its duty to fight infection? I am the Lord that healeth thee. Healing, properly speaking, is a gift of God alone, as is your life. Well, what if the elders come and pray over the sick and the physician applies the proper medicine? And what if it doesn't work? Did you notice, people, the prayer of faith is called. Not faith in faith. True faith does not dictate to God. Genuine faith does not tell God the goals that God must accept. True faith lets God tell you. And sometimes the answer is no. But see, faith can go whatever God will, can take and accept whatever God sends. Moses reached the borders of the promised land after those miserable years in Egypt, after 40 years of watching sheep, and another 40 years of guiding these people through the wilderness. Moses reached the border of the promised land. And in touching manner, he pleaded with God to go over. Let me plant one foot on that goodly land. I know, Lord, I've labored, I've born, I've fought for it, I've believed it, preached it, and prayed for it. And the Lord's answer was no. In fact, the Lord had to tell Moses to knock it off. Now, I don't want to hear another word about it. You are not going over. You are going to die. You are going to die in Moab. And St. Paul says, Trophimus, fellow worker, Trophimus have I left in my Miletum sick. 
Why did Paul leave Trophimus sick? Well, because Paul couldn't heal Trophimus, that's why. In that case, the answer was no. You remember the Philippian congregation, lovely bunch of folks, they'd sent a guy across the sea to help Paul. Never worked out because the guy got there and fell ill immediately. And he felt so bad that he'd become a burden all the while he was there instead of a help. But that's the way it fell out. He never put in a well, healthy day to be of assistance. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. Not everything, but much. Your prayers accomplish surely more than you deserve. And ordinarily affect more even than you desire or imagine. But we better let the rest of this, the last verses, God willing, go till the next Sunday. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.